Hello class. In this video we're going to be taking a closer look at Jesus and at the idea of atonement. And atonement is just how Jesus saves us from our sins. So there's a lot of different ways that this has been understood historically. So we're first going to take a look at uh, Jesus and some of the ways that Jesus was kind of weird and unexpected. And then talk about different ways that we have understood, understood uh, Jesus's uh, saving us or atonement uh, throughout history and then maybe kind of piece together um, what that means for us today. <clears throat> so one of the first things that's important to note about Jesus is that Jesus is really weird. Uh, Jesus is a very strange messiah and he was not what people were expecting. So there's a number of weird things about Jesus's ministry that we maybe don't think of as weird because we're just used to Jesus. That's all that we ever have known. Um, but one weird thing is this idea of the messianic secret. Uh, this comes out really in all the Gospels. But it's the idea that Jesus doesn't want people to know that he's the Messiah. <clears throat> so one passage where this is talked about is in Matthew 16, 13 through 20. It says, <clears throat> Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do the people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on heaven, loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone he was the Messiah. Now, the end of that story should sound weird to you. Peter makes this grand declaration. Other people are saying Jesus is a prophet or whatever. Uh, he's some special guy, but they're not really sure. Peter comes out with this bold declaration of faith saying, you're the Messiah, you're the anointed one, you're the one that we've been waiting for. Jesus is like, awesome, good work, now don't tell anybody. Now why would Jesus do that? Um, and the answer to this question uh, in most theological circles is to say that Peter understood that Jesus was the Messiah, but Peter didn't understand what the Messiah was actually going to do. Peter was sort of stuck in a wrong way of thinking about the Messiah that we're going to take a look at in a second. And we see this happen really quickly, where right after this, Jesus is talking about how he is going to need to suffer and die. And then Peter says, no, that's not going to happen. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Well, that's pretty strong language. Uh, I think we'd all be pretty devastated if Jesus referred to us as Satan. Um, but <clears throat> what Jesus is demonstrating is that Peter doesn't really know why Jesus is there. Jesus doesn't understand what his identity means, so he can't talk about it yet because Peter thinks that he's going to be this conquering king, and actually Jesus is the suffering servant. Um, another way that Jesus is very strange is he didn't reestablish proper temple worship. That's something that people were looking for in the Messiah. Jesus also did not defeat the Roman Empire, but he presumably was going to defeat the Romans, uh, reestablish the nation of Israel. Um, and we see just over and over again in the Gospels that people don't understand what Jesus is up to. So we see another example of that in Mark chapter 8, verses 14 through 21. <clears throat> It says, Now the disciples had forgotten to bring any bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. They said to one another, It is because we have no bread. And becoming aware of it, Jesus said to them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes and fail to see? Do you have ears and fail to hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you collect? They said to him, Twelve. And 
the seven for the four thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you collect? And they said to him, seven. Then he said to them, do you not yet understand? I, mean, I don't think that you can read this passage and not see how frustrated Jesus is getting. He's saying, I'm telling you guys over and over again, what's going on? I'm trying to tell you things that are going to happen. I'm trying to lay out the kingdom of heaven for you, and you just are not tracking with me. <clears throat> so we see even Jesus' closest followers, the people that Jesus handpicked to lead the church after Jesus left, still don't know what's going on, and they won't know what's going on until after Jesus' resurrection. Um, and I just think that that story is a great example of that, and I think it's pretty hilarious to think of Jesus just sort of like wringing his hands and saying, come on guys, give me something. And one reason that Jesus was weird and misunderstood is that Jesus didn't fit the messianic mold. Uh, many Jews expected two messiahs, um, one to be a king and one to be a high priest. Jesus says that he fills both of these roles, um, but that was not what they expected. Um, and they associate Messiah with the idea of a political ruler who conquers his enemies. So we see once in the Bible someone else is referred to as Messiah, and it's King Cyrus of Persia. Um, he restores the people to the land. He allows them to go back and rebuild the temple, and he is called a Messiah for doing this. So restoration of land and temple are associated with messianic identity. And people were looking for this restoration of land and temple, largely because of something that happened a couple hundred years before Jesus called the Maccabean Revolt. <clears throat> so in this, the Jews had been conquered by this really bad guy, Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, he outlawed Judaism, he desecrated the temple, sacrificed pigs, and they did all sorts of horrible things. And then there was this rebellion, this guy named Mattathias, rebelled along with his sons. Uh, Judah was the main son who eventually became a ruler. They liberated Israel, they cleansed the temple, uh, and then Hanukkah is actually the celebration of that rededication of the temple uh, by the uh, Maccabees that formed the Hasmonean dynasty. Um, so that's what people were looking for Jesus to do, to clear out the Romans, to uh, sanctify the temple again, and to make Israel a powerful nation again. Jesus doesn't do any of that, so he is just very strange in their eyes. So, what was Jesus up to? Uh, later, after Jesus had been resurrected, after Christians were trying to make sense of this really strange Messiah, one of the most important passages became Isaiah 53, which is known as the Suffering Servant Passage. And I'm going to read this in its entirety because it's really important, <clears throat> and it's a fairly short chapter. It says, Who has believed what we have heard, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. <clears throat> but he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? <clears throat> for he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked, and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring, and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper, out of his anguish he shall see light. 
He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he, he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will lot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. <clears throat> so this was not really an important passage in talking about the Messiah in Judaism at the time. But Christians looked back in the Old Testament and saw that this fit what Jesus's mission was, that Jesus came to be that suffering servant, that as N.T. Wright talks about, Jesus's death was his coronation, that <clears throat> he's given a crown, he's raised up and exalted, um, that this is Jesus, Jesus's way of being king. And that ultimately Jesus's resurrection was Jesus's victory. So he takes all of this death and evil and sin into himself, and that isn't able to bring him down, that isn't able to defeat him. And the resurrection is the ultimate vindication of Jesus. So, <clears throat> after Jesus' death and resurrection, all of these weird things that he had been saying made sense, that the last will be first, that you need to lose your life to save it. Um, this upside-down kingdom that he's setting up. So, I would say then, to make sense of Jesus' victory, we must inhabit the inverted world of the kingdom of God, where those who mourn and are persecuted are blessed. It's difficult or impossible for rich people to enter, but easy for children, where the last is first, and only by giving up your life will you save it. <clears throat> now, just, you can take a whole class on Christology, but this is just bare bones Christology, uh, that Jesus is fully God and fully man. Oop, that is a problem. Sorry about that. I might cut that up. All right. So a brief overview of Christology. Jesus is fully God and fully man, a human nature and a divine nature in one body that are separate but united in the body of Christ that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, and that Jesus' mission is salvation. Um, and later, the Holy Spirit comes to uh, nurture and establish the church. Getting to atonement, uh, the one that we're probably familiar with is called penal substitutionary atonement. So in this idea, we owe God a debt because of sin. We can't pay it. Therefore, Jesus comes and pays the debt with his life. Um, and then Jesus' blood covers us, so even though we're guilty, God looks at us and sees Jesus and therefore doesn't condemn us. This is actually <clears throat> really formulated during the Reformation, and it's based on an earlier theory by a guy named Anselm, who said that we had offended God's honor um, and that Jesus needed to come to restore God's honor because we couldn't do it ourselves. So I think that at least these... Uh, ways of talking about these two theories are at least potentially problematic, that we need to avoid some pitfalls here. So Anselm's theory is kind of strange because how can we offend God's honor? We are these finite, minuscule creatures. God is infinite, all-powerful, all-knowing, uh, has everything within God's grasp. So it doesn't seem like we can really do much to affect God. That seems strange. It also seems strange that we're sort of suffering because we've offended God's honor or pride. It seems like God maybe should just chill out a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so I find that theory not very convincing. And it makes more sense uh, during the time that it was formulated, uh, but I don't think that's a very helpful way of thinking about it now. And sub penal substitutionary atonement, the one that you've probably heard about and sung about and all that, is helpful, but I think we need to understand a few things about it. <clears throat> so one, Jesus is God. So it's not that God is sacrificing God's Son, that is true within the Trinity, but ultimately it's God taking our place. So God sacrificing God's self, um, because they're <clears throat> inextricably bound together in the Trinity. 
We also can't say that Jesus is sort of hiding us from God because the Trinity all works together. Jesus can't sort of do something that God isn't doing. That's not how the Trinity works. <clears throat> also, uh, God the Father in this story can sort of come across as this God that wants to hurt us but can't find us, this bloodthirsty, angry God that is sort of looking for sins to punish. But if we look throughout the biblical story over and over again, what God gets mad about is distortions of creation, um, when things have gone wrong not according to God's plan. So God's mad because things are wrong and God wants to make them right. So God's wrath and God's redemption are two sides of the same coin. <clears throat> God's wrath brings about redemption. So it's not just about settling some debt or honor or whatever. It's God bringing things to the way that they're supposed to be. That's the important part about God's wrath. Um, lastly, penal substitutionary atonement can make it seem like the resurrection isn't necessary because if Jesus' death paid for our sins, then we're good to go, right? <clears throat> but Paul explicitly says that without the resurrection, we don't have anything to look forward to. So we need to be careful of just taking this view by itself because it can lead to certain misconceptions. I think that there are important parts of this uh, definitely that come through, <clears throat> but we can't take it by itself. So let's look at a few other theories that have been prominent in the church throughout history. So one is ransom theory. <clears throat> this is saying that we have sort of abandoned our lives to the forces of sin and death, and Jesus gave his life as a ransom for us instead. So the difference in this is <clears throat> in penal substitutionary atonement, we owe God something, and Jesus is essentially paying God. In ransom theory, we've given up our lives to sin and death and Satan and evil, and we owe our lives to them, uh, kind of like Edmund owes his life to the White Witch. But Jesus <clears throat> takes our place. Uh, that was a reference to the Chronicles of Narnia, by the way, if you're not familiar with it. Um, Jesus takes our place and then is able to resurrect himself from the dead. So therefore, Jesus has defeated sin and death, and we're free to follow Jesus then. And we see this in Mark 10, 45. It says, For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. We also see this idea of Jesus as a moral exemplar. So we never have seen anyone who's perfect and righteous before. Um, but through Jesus, we get an example of what a perfect human life looks like. So this is an important aspect of Jesus' atonement, saving us, is giving us this perfect example to follow. Um, and that's something that we miss if we just talk about Jesus' death. Jesus' life is also very important because we're supposed to be little Christs. We're supposed to act like Jesus. <clears throat> There's also Christus Victor, which is the idea that through death and resurrection, Jesus conquers death, that this is Jesus's victory. So this is how Christ becomes victorious, is through death and resurrection. This is acknowledging Jesus's victory. And we see this all over the place, but one nice one is 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57. <clears throat> o death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the last one I'll talk about is the idea of recapitulation. This is one of the earliest uh, theories of the atonement. We see it in the writings of Paul. And this is the idea that Adam was supposed to be God's helper, God's servant, God's priest in the world, but Adam rebelled, and we're all sons of Adam, or daughters of Adam, daughters of Eve. <clears throat> um, so Adam messed up, and that sort of started this process where everything's messed up afterwards. But Jesus came to be the new Adam, to restore things, to give us a new shot at being human the right way, to be truly human. <clears throat> and we see this in Romans 5, 18 through 19. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, namely Adam, 
So one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. For just as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many were made righteous. So here we see that Jesus is this new Adam who got it right. So hopefully this gives you a more kind of fleshed out view of the atonement. That it's not just about Jesus' death and paying our debt. That's an important part. Um, that's one thing that gets mentioned in the New Testament. There's all these other ways that the atonement's talked about and we can get this kind of pigeonholed view and come to these uh, wrong, damaging conclusions if we take that by itself and don't look at the whole history of how we've understood the atonement. So hopefully this uh, short video gives you a little look into what the atonement has looked like throughout history.